The Overwhelmed Brain is a proud provider of self-empowerment for your personal evolution. And, oh, did you go over to audible.com forward slash brain? You can use their service free for a month. Head over there, seriously. Just look up their titles. Haven't you ever wanted to read a book without having to actually read it? Haven't you ever wanted to hear a newspaper? Are you annoyed by affirmations? What about when someone pats you on the back and tells you to think positively? Just because the doctor gave you bad news five minutes ago doesn't mean you can't start enjoying the rest of your day right now. Gray skies are gonna clear up. If affirmations feel like lies face. and positive Brush thinking off. feels like denial, then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted now. <laughs> This is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain and your personal empowerment coach. And the word personal comes in again because this is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. If you're here to learn more common sense tips for improving your life, you're in the wrong place. This is the direct path to uncommon sense, and that's why it's going to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. Today's quote is by someone named Paul Coliani. (laughs) Yes, me. I want to stress something very specific, and it's this. Is what I'm doing today in alignment with my desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence on this planet? I want you to hang this on your refrigerator. I want you to hang this on your office cubicle wall. I want you to put it in your wallet. I want you to laminate it. (laughs) Whatever you need to do, put it on your bathroom mirror, whatever you need to do so that Every day you can ask this question, is what I'm doing today in alignment with my desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence on this planet? When you ask yourself that question, then you can evaluate what you have in your life, what you do, what decisions you make, what job you have, the people you keep in your life. You can evaluate that statement and find out that if you are going forward in life, or you're in stagnation, or even going backwards in life. This is kind of an overall philosophy that I use in my life. And I use an internal check, uh, like an instinctual or gut check, where if something doesn't feel right to me, if I take on a new task or a new project, or make new connections or talk to someone new, I check in to see how it feels. And I have this, like I said, this internal gut check that tells me if it feels good or feels bad. And then I ask myself the question, is what I'm doing in alignment with my desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence on this planet? It's a broad question, but it's a very acute one that will lead you to make the right decisions for you. That's what the show is all about, empowering you to make the right decisions for you. So having this question always available to you, where you can refer to it, will help you figure out if you're on track. Now, what does that mean? That means when you're at work and you get this feeling that there's something that you don't like, or it doesn't feel very good, but you can't figure out what it is, think about what you're doing. Think about the tasks that you're doing or the people that you work with and run these tasks and people through this filter this question is this person in alignment with my desire for a happier more fulfilling existence on this planet is this work in alignment with that you can do it at home you can do it with family you can do it at work wherever you want to do it what it will do is it will start giving you a gauge something to measure by something that when you ask yourself that question how many responses do you get that are yes and how many do you get that or no? Now, that doesn't mean that the situation you're in is unpleasant for now and it's leading to something worse. In fact, that's an important observation. 
what you're doing now could be a stepping stone to something better. So if you're in a situation that is not currently in alignment with your desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence on this planet, that doesn't mean that it's not a means to an end. But, you know, there's other important questions that you have to ask yourself. Will what you're doing ever change? Will the people that you relate to on a daily basis ever change? And if they are changing and improving and things are always getting better, then that sounds like a means to an end. But if there are promises made and things never seem to get better, then you might have to start creating deadlines. You know, whether in your mind or on a calendar, think about what in your life does not align with your desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence. I mean, think about that for a few seconds. What comes up? Now, some stuff may not be in alignment with that. Some stuff is neutral and some stuff is definitely in alignment with that. So the idea is to balance all the good ones <laughs> with the bad ones and find out if there's more good than bad and will those good ones uh, overpower or be more dominant in your life so that the bad ones really aren't affecting you at all. I mean, because there's always going to be something in your life that affects you negatively, something a little bit toxic, something a little bit uh, dysfunctional that you just can't seem to get away from. And you have to ask yourself, how powerful is that in my life? Does it make me miserable or is my miserable moment only 2% of the time? And if that's the case, you know, maybe it'll be okay with you. But if your miserable moment is 98% of the time and you experience 2% of a neutral or happy moment, that's something that you have to seriously consider as far as what options you have. And we all have options, some that we don't want to consider, but there are options. So the reason I want to talk about this today is that uh, in the next segment, Ask Paul, I read a letter from someone who feels like there are no options or the options are something that she refuses to consider. You know, we've all been in situations where it feels like we don't have a choice. We don't have an option. We don't have a way out or an escape or another path to take. We feel like we have to stay in a job we hate. We feel like we have to stay in a relationship we hate. We feel like we have to be around family we hate. And then we look at our life and go, wow, 98% of the time I feel miserable? What's the point? <laughs> and I don't mean that to sound fatalistic, but I do want it to be a seed in the back of your mind to start to consider what is toxic in your life that you need to cleanse? Consider it an emotional toxic cleansing. Because when you start to detoxify your mind and body from the toxic influences in your life, then guess what? You will start to feel this alignment with your desire for a happier, more fulfilling existence on this planet. You will start to feel it. You won't even have to seek it. It just happens because you start addressing the toxicity in your life and you start cleansing it from your body and soul. And I know before you say it <laughs> that some of the toxicity in your life is, quote, impossible to get rid of. So let's talk about this today. I get into it deeper in the next segment. So stick around. We'll be right back. Every week we talk with Asha with GetOutOfTheMess.com. She seems to know a little bit about everything and has the scars and the skills to prove it. Asha is an independent associate for Legal Shield, so you can call her and ask her any question you'd like to find out if this is the right service for you. This service is like having an attorney at your beck and call anytime you need one. And it's crazy affordable at about $20 a month. 
So there's really no reason to not consider it for almost anything that you might have to deal with in life. So anyway, let me ask Asha this. What about something that almost all of us have to deal with? I mean, we've talked about divorce and custody situations and negligent organizations who know that most people won't have the time or money to sue so that they just keep staying negligent and of course getting away with what they might have done to you. But what about something as simple as a traffic ticket? This is something that we all deal with. Can this legal insurance cover us for basic traffic violations? Asha, take it away. Yes, in fact, if you've been a member for 15 days, that's when your moving violation uh, assistance comes into play and you get stopped and you get some kind of traffic violation, what you're going to do is you're going to call the law firm that they gave you when you signed up for the service. You're going to open a ticket just like you always do and you're going to tell them what it's for. They'll have somebody call you back just like normal within six business hours and then they'll talk to you and help you understand the kind of ticket you got, what kind of possible outcomes there are based on the ticket that you got and you know what kind of evidence they have, that sort of thing. And then you'll decide together if it makes sense for them to represent you in court. Now, them actually representing you is free as part of your service. It's included with your monthly membership fees. However... There are court costs that you will need to pay. They're not exorbitant, but it is a fee. And it depends on where you are, how much it's going to be. So you do want to factor that in. In cases where it's like a moving violation that's um, like a, a speeding ticket or something like that, often they can get it reduced or dismissed based on your driving record and, you know, all the other factors that they understand. In which case, if they do get it reduced, you can eliminate points on your driving record, which then also eliminates insurance increases and uh, problems with getting changing insurance and being reevaluated. All right, Asha, thank you so much. How can people reach you if they have any questions? You can call me at 678-355-8777, or you can go to getoutofthemess.com or click the Get Out of the Legal Mess button on theoverwhelmbrain.com. This next segment is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to answer and help them through the challenge. For today's Ask Paul segment, I'm going to read an email from a listener who is subscribed to my newsletter. In the newsletter, I usually tell a short story or give you some insight on what you can do to make specific situations in your life a bit more tolerable. (laughs) Now, before I read this letter, I just want to tell you briefly how my newsletter works. Once you sign up, you'll get a quick personal growth tip or story once a month. You'll also get a weekly update on the latest episode, along with some personal information that I don't share anywhere else. There's always a personal growth lesson or two in my emails, but I do tend to be a bit more candid in the newsletter. Anyway, today I'm going to read a message from Jenny. No, that's not her real name. (laughs) And if you're a regular listener, I also know that I always use the name Jill when it's a woman, but I realize that there may be a Jill out there somewhere that wants to write to me, but is afraid that I'll actually use her real name on the air. (laughs) So I decided to start mixing the names up a bit. So I'm no longer going to stick with the name Jill. From this point on, not every email will be signed by Jill or Jack if it's a guy. And if your name is Jill, write to me and let me know what question you have. (laughs) I promise I'll call you Amy or Sandra or something else. So anyway, Betty or Jenny or whatever name I said earlier (laughs) wrote to me after she read one of my newsletters. It was a story I told about my 13-year relationship, and how I always felt invalidated by my girlfriend. Now, before I read Jenny's email, let me just share a little bit more of my story. My girlfriend at the time didn't even realize that she was invalidating me, and all of our arguments would usually end up with me sulking in defeat, and with her having the most rational logical reasoning for her point. And I'd have to be a brilliant brain scientist to figure out how to be even more reasonable and logical in my response to her 
so that I could at least gain some headway in my defense. But because I was so tied up in strong emotions, I had trouble coming up with even the simplest of facts to support my side. So every time I bowed in defeat, angry, hurt, and demoralized, it took me 15 years to realize what was happening. My emotions were being invalidated. Or, let me put it more accurately, I had emotions that she may not have been aware of that were not being validated. I would feel hurt, sad, or angry, and instead of her acknowledgement that I was hurt, sad, or angry, she just chose to plow me over with all the tiniest details of how she was right. But she didn't know she was invalidating me. She couldn't know because... I never shared with her that I was feeling these emotions. So instead, I just got into the thick of the argument and didn't want to express or be vulnerable. And because of that, I never gave her a chance to see what I was feeling. So I felt like I was being invalidated. I felt like I didn't matter to her. I felt as if all she cared about was being right. I felt that way for 13 years, and I never shared it with her. What would have happened if I shared it? I mean, maybe she would have become more compassionate, and maybe our conversations could have been more real and authentic. Instead, they were highly charged bursts of emotion buried under reason and logic and a strong desire to defend oneself so that they could win. She won every argument Because I chose not to be vulnerable. And in that particular newsletter that I'm referring to, I remind you that you are worthy. You are valued. Your thoughts, emotions, opinions, and ideas matter. And sometimes days, weeks, months, and even years go by that are wasted when you're with people who don't share in that truth. Now, I believe that wholeheartedly. I get letters every day from people that have some really serious stuff going on, stuff that I would never want to experience, but they want a better life. They want to get out of their struggle. I have coaching clients that want to be heard, to know that they are significant and important to someone in their life. You are significant. You are important. You are worthy. I know this to be true because just having the desire to improve yourself in any way is a sign of self-worth. Because desire to improve only comes from a place of worth. Even if you're feeling depressed or worse, even if you can't see the meaning of anything in your life, when you tune into this show or other shows that have a mission to help you improve your life somehow, the motivation in you to do so comes from a deep place of purpose and meaning and a desire to want to feel better and live a more enriching life. That is worthy. And you know people that have no desire to improve. They have no desire to evolve emotionally or psychologically. They have no desire to make your life easier either. (laughs) They may not even care if you don't like how they are. And they may not even care if you're suffering because of their behavior. They might not care at all about themselves. So how could you possibly expect them to care about you or anyone else? But you care about yourself. Because here you are trying to absorb as much as you can about creating a better life for yourself. Even if you don't feel like you care about yourself, it doesn't matter because here you are. (laughs) You are right here, right now, hearing my words and maybe things being said to you for the first time in a long time or ever. Whatever seed of motivation that prompted you to tune into this show is the seed of worth wanting to thrive in some small or even big way. And then there are those that don't want to improve 
and think that they're fine as they are. And they may be right. They may be absolutely fine with who they are. In fact, you can see that as an obvious fact with some people, can't you? (laughs) You might know someone who has no problem being who they are, even though it's clear that those around them are suffering or unhappy in some way. Not my problem, (laughs) they might say, or maybe they don't say those words, but you feel the sentiment regardless. I'm not the one with the problem. You are. And you know what? This is where the truth may actually hurt. Because they may be right. You may be the one with the problem. (laughs) Now, let me put that into perspective. If there's someone in your life that you simply can't stand how they behave, and they're showing no effort in improving themselves or improving the way they act towards you, and you keep them in your life, who do you think is responsible for your unhappiness? Do you think that the person that you know that will never change is responsible for making your life miserable? (laughs) Or do you see that by you staying in a situation that continually exposes you to such toxicity, you're doing it to yourself? I'm not saying that there's a right or a wrong attitude to have here. I do realize there are seemingly unavoidable situations that we get ourselves into because we're afraid of what life might be like without those particular people in our life. But I am saying that you play just as much a role in what you get from any relationship, whether it's family or friends or romantic, simply because you choose to keep showing up. When the stove is on and you refuse to move your hand, You can't blame the stove for burning you. So as I segue into today's email, it's not that I've already taken a stance one way or another. I just want to make it clear that there is an equal amount of responsibility on both sides of the issue here. And what usually happens is that the one who has the least amount of problem with any arrangement is usually not the one who takes any sort of action or leaves the situation. In other words, a stove doesn't leave the kitchen. It stays right there and burns anything that comes near it. So, I'll read today's email and then give you my response in a moment. All right, here's today's email. Dear Paul, good morning, and thank you for this wonderful insight. Remember, she's responding to my email about invalidation and how you are worthy and significant. She says, it is the very thing I struggle with almost every day of my relationship with my husband. It took me many years to figure out what the problem was. I have felt so minimized because no matter what my input, no matter how I deliver it, I have been dismissed time and time again. My husband has made so many major and minor decisions based on what he wants, without even considering my feelings, opinions, or the impact that they'll have on me. Now, once I began to understand what was happening, I experimented and tried reversing my opinions and desires, etc., just to double-check on what I thought was actually happening. It turned out I was right. He was often pulling in the opposite direction from me just to have the upper hand, or so he thought. It seemed he just had to be in charge of everything. Once I pointed this out in marriage therapy, I believed he would realize his behavior and then work on changing it. To my surprise, however, it has just gotten worse. I have emotionally shut down to a great extent, and I find myself feeling hurt and angry almost all of the time. Worst of all, I think of life without him and how much better that may be. Divorce is a very real desire, but the guilt of having another failed marriage is depressing to me, and I just plug away, not knowing how I'd survive without his income. I continue to point out to him for a while that there is no I in teamwork, but he just goes about his life as usual, pretending I don't exist. That is, unless he needs me to perform specific functions and tasks 
which he expects me to fulfill, and I do. Invalidated, undervalued, ignored, and disrespected. All words I have used to describe how I feel over the past six years. Thank you for making my day with your kind and supportive words. So simple, but so powerful. It makes me realize just how painful living in a one-sided relationship can be. I truly enjoy your words and insight. Bless you for your kind and helpful information. I wonder if you even know how much you help people you don't even know. I wish you a delightful day. Jenny. All right. Thank you so much for sharing all that, Jenny. And thank you for your words about me and the show. I'm truly honored that you think that. So let me dive into the first thing that sticks out more than anything from your message. You said you struggle almost every day of your relationship with your husband. You are dismissed time and time again. Decisions are made without you and therapy only exacerbated the problems. On top of all that, you've shut down emotionally and you feel hurt and angry almost all of the time. Think about this. Let me repeat that because I wrote it all down. You struggle almost every day. You're dismissed time and time again. You aren't included in decisions. And you're basically emotionally shut down except for hurt and angry feelings. Let me ask you something. When you think about what marriage is supposed to be, is any of what I just mentioned included in those thoughts. When you imagine living with someone and making a home and family, being with them every day for the rest of your life, does that include a daily miserable existence? I mean, I don't want to bring you down, but I really want you to soak in what you wrote to me because if that's marriage, I don't want any part of it. That's why I'm asking you, Is that marriage to you? Now, I can't hear you, but I'm willing to bet that you define marriage much differently than that, at least the way it's supposed to be. Let me share with you the story of a good friend of mine who may actually be listening right now. He was married to a woman he really couldn't stand to be around. There were personality differences, cultural differences, and even differences in the way they raised their child. On top of that, they were of the same religious beliefs and divorce was simply not an option if they wanted to stay a member of their faith. So one night he told me that no matter what he did, his wife would always yell or get upset at him or ridicule him or a number of other things that seemed to never end. At the time, I was in a good relationship and I couldn't understand what he was saying. (laughs) I asked, So every night you go home from work and get harassed by your own wife? Is that the exception or the rule? He said that it happened almost every day. I went, every day? (laughs) I was in shock. And he looked at me a little funny, as if that kind of information shouldn't be surprising to me. So thinking about how I'd feel in that same situation, I said to him, wow, I can't imagine knowing that I'm going to be married for the rest of my life until I die and that I'll never be happy because I have to come home to someone who seems to hate me. I can't imagine knowing that I will never experience happiness again. He just gazed across the room, gazing at nothing really, taking in my words. I wasn't trying to put him down or make him feel bad. I was just trying it on to understand what he must be going through. Then he finally snapped out of his thought processes and said, I never thought about it that way. And then I think we talked a little bit more about it, but not much after that because it wasn't mentioned again. But I could tell that for the first time, the finality of it all crept in. I could see that he never had thought about what that really meant, being married to someone who seems to hate you. He soaked it in, and that conversation that night set something in motion for him that would change his life. Now, Jenny, the reason I repeated what you said to me a couple times is so that you can grasp a real understanding of what life is going to be like if you choose to stay in a relationship 
that eats away at your very soul. There's a comfort zone that you keep expanding to include more and more discomfort every day. Soon you will have expanded your comfort zone so far that almost any disastrous deed he does will be tolerable to you. The water boils slowly and you just adjust to the heat. The realization is that he will never change and you will never be happy with him unless he changes. But accepting that he will never change has to be your first step. It will never get better than it's been and it will only get worse. You said that he doesn't consider your feelings, opinions, or the impact his decisions will have on you. A clear indication that all he really cares about is himself. So let me ask you again. Is this a marriage? Is this really what a marriage is to you? If you didn't answer no, then say it anyway. No, this is not a marriage. To me, a marriage is all about strengthening the love, bonding, and connection that you have with your partner. It's about supporting each other so that each can be happy and pursue interests that bring them joy. It's a commitment to sharing experiences and learning and growing together. It's a celebration of the time that you want to spend together. What you described to me is the opposite of that. So when I read about how depressing it would be to have another failed marriage, I want you to remember that you succeeded in the marriage, but he failed. You did everything you could to make it work. He didn't. You're a catch. <laughs> because look at all you tolerate, yet you're still there. That gives so many other people room to make mistakes <laughs> if you were to ever pursue another relationship. The thing is, he's not even trying to not make mistakes because he simply doesn't care. In fact, he already knows you won't leave, so he'll just keep doing what he wants when he wants. Think about everything I'm saying here. You said, worst of all, I think of life without him and how much better that might be. That's worse than what you're experiencing every day of your relationship? <laughs> How is that worse? I mean, I know your reasoning. It's the guilt of having another failed marriage. Well, let me say this. If I were in your shoes right now, I would be seeing this as the empowering feeling of another successful divorce from someone who does not value the amazing person I am. You are are amazing. I know this is true. I'm not saying that you should get a divorce. I can only guide you in the sense that if I were in your shoes, I would rather be broke and homeless than with someone who didn't care about me and dismissed me and invalidated me and made me feel like any less than I know myself to be. I'd rather be alone than with someone who makes me feel worse than alone. I know this isn't always possible, and I'm not suggesting anything rash, but I am suggesting that you start making immediate plans to honor yourself in whatever form that takes. For me, that means getting out of the toxic relationship. For you, it may mean something different. You have very real concerns if the marriage ends, especially financially. Yes, your finances will change, but... You also have legal rights. Talk to an attorney, or at least talk to Asha <laughs> with GetOutOfTheMess.com because she's been through this very situation. She has been married to a man that became selfish and did whatever he wanted, and I mean whatever he wanted. And she stuck around for years, getting more and more miserable. She talked with her attorney, got things in order, and made her escape plan. Now, after she filed for divorce, he did everything in his power to make it hard on her. He hired the most vicious attorney in the area and made sure she had a massive uphill battle ahead. There are men that do this. I guess there are women that do this too, but <laughs> mostly men. They make the battle so hard and the escape so impossible that the women they are trying to control buckle from the pressure. They give in, and then they submit 
to more time in the emotional prison they call their marriage. Now, just to be clear, I support marriage. I'm a proponent of marriage, but only when it's a marriage, the way I define it. And I'm not saying that divorce has to be your path because I don't know your situation well, but the way you describe him tells me that nothing will change and that things will only get worse. And then soon you'll be so up to your neck that you'll be barely existing while he's having all the fun he wants. This is not marriage. (laughs) Let me say that again. This is not a marriage. So when you think of another failed marriage, I want you to remember what marriage is supposed to be and know that in order for it to really be called a marriage, both people have to give in to it, not take away from it. When you give and give and he takes and takes, this is not a marriage. This is not a love relationship. It's a dominant, submissive one. This is not friendship and bonding. It's hardship and bondage. This is not a marriage. So you cannot feel guilty about another failed marriage because this doesn't qualify. Now, you may have the paper that says otherwise, but if that's all that defines a marriage, then I want nothing to do with it, and neither should you. You and I both know that marriage can and should be so much more than that. Marriage should be the amplification of good feelings, not the disintegration of them. You've done what you can to make this work. Now do what you can to honor yourself and give yourself what you're worth. Yes, again, your income level will change, but maybe not by much. That's what lawyers are for. They will make sure that you know your rights and they'll tell you how the money will be distributed if you decide to get a divorce. If you have no one else, call Asha and ask her questions. Or if you don't want to talk to anyone about this, just make Google your friend. Informed and ready is much better than the opposite. I mean, you said it yourself. You are continually invalidated, undervalued, ignored, and disrespected. Whether you choose to create another successful divorce or stick around the toxicity and live in the hope that things will somehow get better, no matter what, start gathering as much data as possible so that you're an informed, active participant in your future instead of just waiting for the next shoe to drop. I want you to be treated the way you deserve, the way you give, because what you give, you get back. Unless you're purposefully putting yourself in situations where the person you give to does not have it in him to give back. And if that's the case, then perhaps your choices in life need to be reevaluated so that they serve you instead of someone who can't reciprocate. So I'm going to wrap up my answer to you with this final statement. If you choose to stay, the situation will not change. Accept this completely so that you can decide what you need to do as things stand today. If you choose to leave, the situation will change and things may actually get better. The question is, do you choose to stay in misery or venture out into possibility? My married friend went home from work and was miserable every day. And he realized it was going to be this way for the rest of his life. When this thought came to mind, he decided to get a divorce. The church didn't like this and even excommunicated him, but he was happier and has since had more peace in his life. Whatever you choose, Jenny, make decisions that honor you, not ones that Honor someone else who doesn't honor you, and you know where that leads. You deserve to be treated with love and appreciation. So do what's right for you and cleanse the toxicity in your life in the way that works for you. Thank you so much for writing. I wish you the best with this situation.
All right, welcome back. I just want to mention real quick that I am a personal empowerment coach. And what that means is that if you're in a place where you don't feel empowered to make decisions that are right for you, I help you get there. And the way I do it is I figure out what is stopping you from creating the life you want. What is stopping you from being empowered? Are, do you have any fears? Do you have any anxiety? Are you feeling depressed? I mean, are there things going on in your life that you feel like are holding you back, that are sabotaging your progress? I think a huge issue for a lot of people is self-sabotage. They start to do something. They start a project or they venture forth in something small or big, and then they do something else to sabotage that forward momentum. This kind of stuff is one of my specialties. I've done this in my own life, and I've figured out what happens inside of us that causes us to do this. Now, there are many reasons. I can't open them all today, but you've heard my show. You've heard me talk plenty of times regarding what stops you from creating what you want in your life. And one of those things is personal boundaries. How do you honor yourself? You heard me talk to Jenny in the last segment. How is she honoring herself by staying with someone who completely disregards and disrespects her? I want her to have the happiest life possible. And when I see a situation that can be fixed, that has a solution, but uh, the person that's in the situation is afraid to step into that solution because of the fear of consequences, because of the fear of the unknown and that they'd rather stay miserable than uh, walk a path towards possibility, towards a possible good outcome. I mean, one way is 100% miserable, and the other way is there's a possibility that you'll be miserable, but there's a higher possibility that you'll be happier. So, in my mind, there's a clear path to take. But I realize that you can't always get there on your own. Because you're embroiled in everything that's going on. You don't have a third party observer that knows your entire situation and can give you an unbiased perspective on what you need to think about or what you can address, what's stopping you from making those types of decisions. Wherever you are, whether it's in your relationships or your personal life or your career, if there's something that is stopping you, if there's something that you can't seem to get past, Maybe it's a decision. Maybe it's an emotional block of some sort. Or maybe you've listened to this show over and over and over again and you still have something that you haven't gotten over. Reach out to me. I do one-on-one coaching and I am here to help you get through it. Visit theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on Coach with Paul. You'll see what I have to offer and certainly you can reach out to me for a free 15-minute consultation. So if you're not sure if this is the right path for you, then book a free consultation with me. I want you to be comfortable with me and you know we'll certainly get to know each other before we talk and I think that's important. Again, visit theoverwhelmedbrain.com and click on Coach with Paul. All right, for our What's in the Box segment, I'm just going to teach you a little brain trick. <laughs> and this is something I learned in my NLP training years ago. Uh, It's one of the the basics, so to speak, and it has to do with how we have memories that are attached to emotions and how we can diminish the bad emotions and enhance the good ones. And all I mean by that is that if you have an event that happened in your life, you know, nothing seriously traumatic, although it could work with that too, but an event that happened in your life that was unpleasant that was bad that you when you think about it now it uh, brings bad feelings bad emotions um hard to deal with emotions sometimes whether it's sadness or anger or embarrassment or rejection when you have a thought like that there's usually a picture that goes along with it like for example i'll try to think of something that i feel bad about and i think when I was in my 20s, uh, and I'll be vulnerable here because I don't like this story and it is hard for me to talk about. So this would be a good experiment for me too. 
when I was in my 20s, I was young. I, I was I was a young 20-something, <laughs> and I was still making uh, probably teenage decisions as if I were a teenager. But, you know, I had a couple cats. They were wonderful cats. But in my 20s, I just felt like I couldn't take care of them. So I brought them to the Humane Society. And I think about that time. I think about leaving them in the cage and I get really sad. I can feel my tears coming up right now thinking that I can't believe I left them. It's awful. So I still have some memories that trigger emotions in me even though there's nothing I can do about it today. I mean, it's been way over 20 years and the cats are long gone, and I don't know whatever happened to them, if some other family picked them up, I hope, or if they were put down. I just don't know. And so today I think about that, and I feel bad. I feel sad. I feel awful, because I would never see me doing that today, no matter how bad it got for me. And if I couldn't afford to feed myself, I would probably feed my animals before myself. So that's how crazy I am. <laughs> but that's not crazy. I mean, I think about that as a sane thing today because I care about animals and I know that they have emotions just like us. Just like, I think I talked about this in the last episode, just like a fish has emotions, that, at least from my observations. So anyway, I have this picture in my mind, again, that I don't like talking about, but it happened and it makes me sad. And, you know, I feel kind of guilty about it. I feel shame about it. And I want you to go into your past and think about something that you feel bad about. I know this isn't easy, but I'm taking you somewhere with it. Think about something that you feel bad about. Just for a moment. And what emotions come up with that? And... When you think about that, do you get an image in your mind? Now, this isn't all about forgiveness and all this stuff. This little exercise helps diminish the emotions that you have attached to the image that comes to mind. Now, if you don't have an image, this may not work as well, but you can kind of go along with it and just see what happens. But there's always emotions attached to some sort of negative memory that we have. So now you have this picture in your mind. And what I want you to do with this picture, wherever it is in your mind, if, if it's right in front of you, I want you to, in your mind's eye, push it far away as if you were standing 50 feet from it or 100 feet or a, a whole parking lot. Push it far away and just watch the image if it's in color, turn to black and white and start to fade. And just push it far, far, far away until you can barely see it, smaller than a postage stamp, until it's only a dot. And now where you are and where that image is way, way, way over there, what kind of emotions are still attached to that memory? If you did this with me, my emotions are almost gone when I think about that. And to be truthful, I feel bad that I don't feel bad. <laughs> now, that's weird, but, you know, there's a reason because I think I need to own some of this guilt. I think there's a part of me that still needs to address this, and I will. But I'm playing along just like you, and I think about this image that I had, and when that picture of that memory is way down there and I can't see it, I don't have the emotions. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes our emotions are attached to the memories in the form of pictures or sounds. And sounds are a good one to play with, too. Like if you had any sounds that affected you negatively, like someone yelling at you or someone's voice is really irritating or angering you, whatever it is, you can turn those voices into like, really high-pitched Mickey Mouse voices or what I like to do is turn them into donkey voices like everyone's talking like a donkey. <laughs> so when I think about a situation that I'm upset about that involves someone talking to me and I'm upset about it, I just turn their voices into something 
hysterical. That allows me and that allows you to still have the memory, but not have the bad feelings associated with it. For example, I still have a memory of leaving my cats at the Humane Society. This is real time. I don't feel the guilt as much. I still feel, no, I don't really feel, I don't really feel the guilt as much. But it also prompts me like, what can I do to make up for what I did to them? What can I do to make up? And the first thought that comes to mind is donate. Like I can donate to humane societies around here or to no kill shelters or to houses that take care of cats where they have like a hundred cats and they adopt them out. What can I do to make things better for the future? Because you can't really change the past. We can do this exercise and change how we feel or at least diminish the emotional impact it had on us. And there are other exercises where we can actually go into our mind and change what happened or visit that moment in the past and say things that we didn't say at the time all in our mind just to change how it affects us today because it's not useful going forward with bad feelings from the past lingering with us. It's not useful. There's a message in there for us for sure. Like my message is loud and clear that I need to respect life instead of just dropping life off to either be put down or hopefully find another family. I need to respect life. And I I learned that message a long time ago. After that, I was a totally different person and I, I changed in my mind for the better. But I'm not proud of that moment. So what can I do to make up for that? What can I do going forward to make up for that? And that's exactly what I have done. I have donated to no-kill shelters. I've rescued animals and brought them in and I do things uh, for other life forms. I save bugs. <laughs> so I do my part. I do what I can. And even though I don't like the fact that I did that to my cats when I was young, at least I took a positive lesson from it so that it wouldn't happen again in my life. Like when I was married and my wife got us a, a small dog that I didn't want. <laughs> I love dogs too, but I just didn't want a small dog. Uh, she brought it home and I was like, oh, I don't want a dog. But all right, we got this dog and I'm going to commit to taking care of it for its entire life. And there was a point where he was extremely difficult. He was her baby. He barely liked me at all. But I took him through dog training course and I walked with him all the time just so he could get to know me and we got to know each other. But he was still... Uh, very attached to her. And it was a Pomeranian, and Pomeranians do that. They get attached to one person. But, you know, he at least respected me, <laughs> and that was good enough. Uh, but there was a time where there was some c consideration of giving him to another family. And I was thinking how traumatic it would be for him to do, to go through that. And I remembered... Uh, who I was and I remember the commitment I made to myself and I said no we're going to keep this dog and I am going to keep my promise to him that I would take care of him for the rest of his life and I felt pretty good about that and you know even though he could be a pain <laughs> I did it I just committed and I thank my cats for that I thank my cats that went through what they went through back then so that this dog and other animals and even insects that appear in my life have a fighting chance with me. So anyway, when I got a divorce, the dog went with her and I never found out <laughs> what happened to him. Uh, I hope he's okay. But this is something that you can do for yourself. These things are hard to think about. These memories that we have in our past that are especially attached to negative emotions they're hard to think about. I realize that. They're hard to repeat. We don't want to repeat. We don't want to feel guilty again or feel ashamed or 
We're too ashamed to feel ashamed. <laughs> we feel too guilty to feel guilty. But you can do this process and at least uh, alleviate some of that negative cloudiness so that you can move forward and start getting some traction if you're carrying around these negative feelings. It doesn't absolve you from the responsibilities that you have. It just helps you resolve some repressed emotions so that it will clear you up so you can make better decisions in the future. Because there's a lesson in every single uh, event that happened in our life, especially negative. When there's a negative event, there's a lesson there. And I would rather have you learn the lessons and disconnect from the emotions. And I don't mean repress the emotions. I mean literally once they're disconnected from the memory, they fizzle, they disappear. There's no longer the negative charge that that memory had. So again, two things you can do. When you get an image of a bad memory, just send it way, way, way out there. Make it tiny and maybe even fizzle into nothing. And notice how the emotion changes. And if there's any sounds involved, just change those sounds into Mickey Mouse or donkey sounds. Or one I've heard plenty of times from other coaches is that they put uh, circus music in the background. Now, if you're scared of clowns, that's probably not appropriate, but <laughs> put funny music in the background or, you know, kids music or whatever makes it ridiculous. Like some crazy fight you had with your ex, it still causes problems for you today. Just put kids music in the background. B-I-N-G-O, B, -I -N -G -O, B <laughs> and see what happens to you, to your memory. It changes things and you deserve to feel better. Don't carry this stuff around. You can learn the lessons and learn from it. But let's go forward with some more positive feelings so that we can be more productive, more resourceful, and just feel better going forward. So that's what's in the box today. And that's our show for today. Thank you for giving me the space to feel vulnerable. As some of you know, the cat that I had for about 20 years recently died. So I think that's why that memory came up. But I... I was with him until the last second I could possibly be with him. And then I took him somewhere where he would want to be rested. And that's all I'm going to tell you. But I think that's why that memory came up for me today. So again, thank you for allowing me the space to be vulnerable with you. It was great to connect with you today. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. Audible did not sponsor this particular episode because they're waiting for the results from the last episode. But I still like them and I still want you to go check out their site at audible.com forward slash brain. Make sure you put the brain at the end so that they know I'm still sending them awesome people like you. And I also want to thank Asha with getoutofthemess.com. You know how it goes. You can move forward alone and hope things go well, or you can pay less than a dollar a day to get a team of attorneys to get you through almost any situation. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, visit GetOutOfTheMess.com or call 678-355-8777 and talk with Asha today. I want to thank everyone who has purchased a book or a worksheet or used the Amazon link to shop as you normally would which gives us pennies for every dollar you spend. Yes, we have an Amazon button at theoverwhelmedbrain.com and every time you click it and shop on Amazon, Amazon thanks us by sending us a percentage of your purchase. Your shopping habits are making a difference. So thank you. And of course, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the amazing music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. All right, today's episode really focused on validation, invalidation, uh, feeling like you're loved and are significant to other people. You've heard the thing, we're all social creatures and we all need to be with other people. But, you know, I look at my own life and go, I'm quite the introvert. <laughs> I don't mind being alone a lot, but when I'm with people, I really dig it. I really feel the energy. And of course, I like to be 
with、uh, someone I love. I love to be with in a relationship. But is having a relationship so important that I would sacrifice my own peace, my own tranquility, my own worth, my own self-esteem? Is being in a relationship worth giving a lot of that stuff up? And for me, the answer is hell no, no way. If I'm in a relationship and I get disrespected and I don't get listened to, and like with Jenny's letter today, I get dismissed and I'm not involved with decisions, then what's the point? I don't want to be in that relationship. I would rather go off on my own and enjoy myself until someone can come along and enjoy me enjoying myself <laughs> and honor me honoring myself. That to me is a relationship, and that's what I want for you too. Whether you're in a relationship or not, the very first step to a good relationship, whether it's here now or it's coming, is to honor yourself first and be okay being alone. Now that sounds lonely, <laughs> I know, but when you're okay being alone, then you bring no desperate neediness or longing or pining into a relationship, because when you're in a relationship and you always need them, and when they're gone for a few hours, you miss them and you want them back. If you felt that way when you were alone, like I'm so lonely, I need someone, I miss them. And you bring that same person into a relationship, the relationship tends to suffer. I hate to say it, but it does, because what happens is you start depending on the other person to make you happy. You start depending on the other person and having higher expectations of them because they need to be around to make you happy. They need to be around to complete you. You've heard that you complete me. If they need to be around to make you whole, then you're going to be deficient in the relationship. It's just the way it is. It's just the way I've I've never seen it work any other way. Because the more you need from someone else, the more you lack in yourself. So figure out what you lack in yourself when you're alone, and address those things. Work on those things. Take a break from relationships, or if you've been in the longest break and you know a relationship will never come, and you're disappointed by that, then embrace it and accept it, because what happens? And I don't know how the universe works in this way, but what happens when you finally get comfortable being alone, and you finally get comfortable in your own skin? Someone shows up. It's really strange how it works, but someone shows up. And my scientific mind goes, well, of course they show up, because you carry yourself differently. You're out and about, and someone sees you in a way that looks empowered, that looks confident, that looks energized in a way they've never seen anyone before, and they are attracted to that. That's an attractive quality. When you can build that in yourself before you get into a relationship, and then. You add that quality in the relationship. That's strength. That's bonding. Now, am I one hundred percent right about everything I'm talking about here? Probably not. There's probably people out there that do have these longings and and pining for the person when they're gone, and then when they're together, it's beautiful love and romance, and everything is wonderful. And if that's you, great. And if that's been you for the last twenty years. Even better, don't listen to me. <laughs> I just know what is typically the healthiest way to come together. I know that typically the healthiest way to be with yourself is to be comfortable and feel whole. And then the best way to come together is to be comfortable and whole within yourself, which makes the entire relationship comfortable and whole. It's kind of like when you put. Two speakers side by side, and they play the same frequencies. The frequencies reinforce each other and amplify the volume. So you take two people side by side that have this wholeness inside them, and you bring them together. It amplifies the wholeness of the relationship. 
So that's all I'm going to say about that. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And with that, open your mind and step into your power. And be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.